Hello everyone and welcome to CodeCast by STL Tech Talk, where we'll be giving you instructional, informative, unique, and insightful commentary on programming code and technology. From robots to roadhouses, we'll be bringing you the content you want and need. My name is JJ Hammond and I am joined by two coding experts. First up, he is a former Microsoft evangelist who has spent his career helping developers explore new ways to solve problems in the informational space. His website is bencotips.com, and we'll have that in the show notes. Provides developers with resources to get started, new and fun technologies such as cloud, data, and devices. A family man, an all-around awesome man, the very helpful Mike Binkovich. Say hello, Mike. Hey, JJ. How's it going? Fantastic, man. Fantastic. If I haven't said it enough before, mm -hmm. you'll hear me say it again. Thank you so much for being on our show. We really appreciate it. Well, I look forward to uh, having some fun tonight. Tons of good stuff to talk about. I can't tell you. I've been doing uh, building out some stuff on Visual Studio, the new .NET framework. Uh, we've got uh, new stuff in the cloud. It's just amazing what's going on. Oh, you're, you're giving our audience tingles already. However, this show would not be uh, possible or complete without my fellow tech bro and uh, co-host striving to distribute development knowledge to the masses and has spent the last 20 years architecting and implementing highly scalable ASP.NET applications throughout the Twin Cities. Say hello, Gus Emery. Hello, JJ. Hey, Mike. Nice seeing you again. Oh, yeah. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, subscribe to our YouTube channel, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Windows Phone, TuneIn Radio, and or go to our site and get the RSS feed directly so that you can access the MP3 there. Also, go to our site. STL Tech Talk is an experience. We believe anyone can learn about technology. We really do. At the St. Louis STL Tech Talk, we want to be your friends and family you always wanted. Visit stltechtalk.com for a truly fantastic experience where you'll find our tech news, podcasts, codecasts, forums, and coming soon, our how-to tutorials on gadgets and software applications. And don't forget to interact with the live show by giving us feedback at podcast at stltechtalk.com. You can email us there or go to the Q&A chat where you can ask questions and we will do our best to answer those questions throughout the show. So without further ado, let's go ahead and hop right into this thing and ask Mike, what got you first started into developing for uh, software? You know, you have to go back a long way to figure that out. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where it's just ended up being a uh, career you just fall into. Um, you know, you, every, I, you know, you're at that age where it's like, okay, well, when did you first start working with computers? When did you dive in? You know, you have to go back almost to you know grade school and be messing around with computer games and wanting to dive into writing some cool logic around this or that, and it all just kind of kind of played out. So I did that for a while. I ended up going into uh, engineering, getting a degree, and then deciding to um, continue working where I actually had a paying job, which was doing the computer stuff and uh, writing code. And I uh, kind of fell through that to being a uh, running a consulting company here in the Twin Cities up in Minneapolis. I uh, did that for about a dozen years, then went to work for Microsoft for, I don't know, six or eight years doing their MSDN events, um, showing developers what's possible with it. And the best part about that is you uh, have to be um, up on what, what's what's going on with the technology. And, that's, um, um, that's fun, the track. Oh, boy. The, uh, the challenge is, is that everything's changing so fast. Where do you want to spend your time, right? Right, so exactly. Like you've got cloud. You've got uh, just all these options. No, 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 no. We're going to stick to DOS. Are you kidding me with that? Really? That's, that's what you want to do? Have you seen DOS 8? Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm sure Gus has. 8.1? Uh. <laughs> oh, nice. nice. It has graphics now. Well, well played. Well played, sir. Only a few people got that joke, and whoever did, that's freaking hilarious. <laughs> do it. So... Um, that that's cool, man. I mean, a lot of people that we talk to do have a lot of roots in in the in the gaming and wanted to write some logic and stuff. What was some of the first equipment that you ever programmed on? Well, you had uh, probably the Commodore was the way I went. It seemed like back then you were either going the Apple route, you're going the Atari route, the Trash Shady route, or uh, the Commodores. And so I was a VIC twenty guy. Um, actually, before that, I played around on a Commodore Pet, which was. Uh, you know, one of the early machines that has actually had a built-in monitor. It was a luggable in the sense that you could actually pick it up and, you know, with two or three people, haul it to the car and bring it, you know, to and from different schools and stuff. Yeah. Nice. So, 
You know, it's amazing how the uh, the uh, all-in-one kind of did their entire loop around, isn't it? Yeah. Started with an all-in-one, now we're back to all-in-ones again. They're called <laughs> Raspberry Pis, right? Yep, right. exactly. It's almost the same idea. Plug it yep. into a TV and, wow, you got a computer. Yeah, Boom. exactly. Yeah. Who needs a monitor? No, they don't need monitors. <laughs> right. <laughs> I.O. devices, right? Yeah. Plug it yeah, in. Exactly. Exactly. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your professional background? I mean, you talked about the consulting company and whatnot. What are you doing now? So uh, since I left Microsoft, I've been doing uh, consulting on a variety of different small projects, uh, big projects, um, doing things like uh, helping write uh, sample code. Um, I've been doing some. Uh, I've been doing a little bit of um, developing courseware for uh, app dev learn now learn now online so you can go out just finished a course on visual studio 2013 i mean that's where this code where where the stuff that i'm kind of you know been doing lately is coming from um, also i've done a lot of talking about uh, the windows azure the cloud stuff i ran the azure boot camps for a couple of years and helped out uh, drive content on that and scheduling and kind of put stuff together um, working with the azure team to you know make that all usable and and friendly and fun and, you know it's 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 interesting getting out and using it and seeing how it fits into the real world. Right. Yeah, right. definitely, definitely. And how it how it scales for sure. I mean, I, I'm sure you've come across like just one-off scenarios where you're just like, I don't think I would have thought about it in that in that context, mm -hmm. or at least at some point, you know. Well, I I had a, a customer. They have a, a little database they needed to get converted, and it's like, can you do this for us? Sure. Okay, I'll spin up a server in the cloud. Um, and then take their 750 million records. Uh, <laughs> right. Small database, right? Do a little bit of processing on it for a couple days, you know, and, and spin up a couple of eight core machines with 56 gig of, rem of memory. You know, it takes you 10 minutes to spin it up, and then it's like, okay, now we can actually do some real work. The data files by themselves were like 243 gig. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Huge. Yeah. So, it's, so, so it's like you open up scenarios like that or um, another customer was, uh, look, I just came in for the day to kind of help them see, you know, okay, well, what's the cloud, can, what can it do for us? And it's like, well, you know, we've got this uh, report that we're trying to run. It's like, well, you could throw it on a uh, VM, throw it in SQL Server, put it in the, in the cloud, turn it on, and you could have a uh, complete uh, cloud solution to it. We built it out in two or three hours, and it was done by the time I got done just, you know, walking through the cloud, it's like, oh, cool, this actually works. It's like, yeah, now you can scale across as many of these as you need. I love the skepticism when it comes to the cloud, like when you explain it to people, and you're like, yeah, this actually works, you know. It, mm -hmm. It's just like a computer, just not here. <laughs> well, it, it's just like a computer, yeah. This is just like the, the magic. It's like the magic software. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Elves put it together and everything. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, I mean, we create magic, Mike. We really do. We we make things do what we tell them to, right? That's what you would like and to like, think that. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it doesn't work all the time, right? Um, the yeah. bone arrow makers of the day, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. like Technology the, is great when it works. Like, whoa, and we're like, poof, you know, yeah. done. Yeah, done. Yep, definitely. So what type of programming do you enjoy today, Mike? What, what drives you every day? I like the stuff that pays really well. <laughs> I love that answer. I like to sleep on a pillow. Honestly, with money. Yeah. Right. That there is a consultant's answer, by the way. Right. How much you got? Yeah, we could do that. <laughs> no, the uh, the stuff that I, I I've been having fun doing is uh, building out. I've been playing around with uh, MVC lately. That's that's kind of got my um, interest because it's playing around with the Envy framework. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's a lot of neat things you can do very quickly with uh, the, 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 the data migrations, the code first model where you go out and you create the database and you just basically roll out code and, um, and then build it out and I've, it, being able to turn it on and run it in the cloud is, is pretty quick, pretty yeah. cool. You know, I've got a friend of mine that uh, is being pushed to learn MVC and uh, the, you know, he keeps claiming that he can do it faster in ASP.NET, you know, web forms, and I'm like, eh, I don't think so. <laughs> Have you seen everything that MVC can do? You know, MVC well, is so intricate, but yet so easily leveraged with wizards, right? And scaffolding and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, is that uh, you've seen Hanselman's story of, of it's one ASP.NET, yep, right? Exactly. And everything is, you can do web forms, and you can tie in MVC, and you can tie in web API. You can tie in your new identity story. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think it's interesting just seeing how easy it is to go ahead and plug that stuff together, um, yeah. because it's yeah it is a, a matter of just deciding you want to do it. Mm -hmm. But um, you know the uh, the challenges that even though the technology is is there, it's knowing when to use it, and because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. You know, and knowing when not to do it too. Oh, gotcha. gotcha. Totally agree with you whole wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. Because so I can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> but I can help you do it. Uh, I want to go mobile. Do you have any mobile users? No, but I want mobile. Oh. Right. Maybe not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. So what do you do when you go mobile? You know, it's like, is everything going to be an iOS app? Is it going to be an Android app? Or is it going to be a mobile HTML because it fits? You know, at what point do you make that call saying, yeah, we do need an Android Rich client app that's mm -hmm. going to take advantage of all the things that can, device can do. Right. Exactly. That new, the new HTC One or whatever that came out. The is it the One or the M? Yeah, that's the One. Yeah. The yeah. One. Yeah. But it's the 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 M8 is the series number it is because mm -hmm. one before it was the M. So it's it's funny because it's the new one and then you're like, the new one. I don't know. Marketing for that totally <laughs> not good at all. So. Um, that's interesting to me. You brought up actually a, a, a question that popped up, um, at, not directly in our chat, but in another chat room, which was, um, how 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 do you, how would like how do you approach that kind of scenario? Like, how would you approach that? And my first thought was, it, when you're do when you're doing with the, the the cloud stuff and you're going this mobile route, it's all about what you think is going to be the long-term solution with some of these devices, right? Like, what what do you think you're going to be able to put put into the devices to make them functional, like on the ground? Because an AT&T phone for an AT&T repair guy is going to be different from like a plumber's phone mm -hmm. uh, or a contractor's phone. You know what I mean? And and each will have different functionalities. I mean, I see I've seen contractors use the iPhone's proximity sensors to do you know to you know measure a room and all that kind of stuff instead of an actual tape measure. So you there's just a lot of different use case scenarios where you know sometimes you almost have to have all three places. You have to have the web, you have to have the, mm -hmm. the apps, and then you have to be able to scale all that. And the cloud is almost the best. It's just the best case to to do all that with. Mm -hmm. Have you played with mobile services? Me, I I, I play with. Are you familiar with it? With what Windows Azure mobile services is? I think Gus is more than I am. Okay, yeah, I've, I've seen a couple of demos. I know I've seen yeah. Mike do a demo for me a couple of times in the mm -hmm. past. But uh, uh, I think you're itching to get to a demo here, Mike. Is that what I'm seeing? It could be. Ah, I don't well. know, you guys want to see some code? Is that yeah, deal? let's do it. So, so let's just hop right in the code. So before we do that, while we let uh, Mike get his systems ready to go, uh, we want to let our audience know we're gonna, this is we're going to be talking about Azure, uh, uh, formerly known as uh, <laughs> Windows Azure and newly known as Microsoft Azure. Uh, right. we're, he's going to be dem demonstrating this on Visual Studios 2013. So that's just for our, our audience's use. And Mike, why don't you go ahead and get us started? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, see if that'll work. So can you see my screen? Uh, yep, it's coming up. Yep, coming up. It. Okay, so you got uh, the, the place where all good things start, bencotips.com, because from here you can click the green link to get a free trial on Azure, right? Why green? Because it's Azure. So if you look at it, um, Azure is going to give you a cloud uh, subscription that you can go ahead and use a variety of different services on. And... Um, Really, it's it's just getting into the portal and getting getting started doing something. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go into the Manage Windows Azure and log into my portal where I've got some stuff out here, and um, just to kind of get started um, working with the cloud and working with what you can do. Um, Windows Azure has a collection of compute, storage, networking, uh, core things that you can build on top of. And then there's like these value add services that go a step beyond that. Um, everything from uh, like mobile services, which I'm going to show you here in a little bit, to media services where it handles video and, and doing streaming and putting down uh, the right kind of stuff for that. Uh, Hadoop, you've got Service Bus, you've got Visual Studio Online. I'll show you something wicked cool on that in a second. Um, scheduling, you've got Traffic Manager, you've got Active Directory. Um, so you have all these different ways I can go out and I can go out and build and do stuff. 
Um, so if I wanted to create a uh, mobile service for us to use today, and I want to get your feedback on things, I can go out and create a mobile service by going out, clicking on new, create a new mobile service. We'll call this our uh, CodeCast azuremobile.net. We'll notice that name hasn't been taken, so I'm going to create a mobile service for you guys. And we'll throw this into an existing database, although I could use a free 20 meg SQL database. Maybe I should do that. Eh, we'll, we'll use an existing database. I'm going to throw it into a subscription I've got on the East Data Center. Click on Next. And then I'm going to go ahead and log into where I've got my database. And this is going to then go out and it's going to provision for me a, um, a RESTful service in the sense that it handles get, put, post, and delete. Anything that can talk across the standard HTTP stack is able to talk to this service and, and interact with it. So that means clients like a uh, Windows Phone client, like a um, Android, iOS. Um, there's also a couple of new ones. PhoneGap is out there. Xamarin's on there. So, and they have uh, sample starter apps that you can use to get started. But once we get CodeCast set up here, give it a second. So a question for you, Mike, while we're waiting for that to be created. How do you feel about um, the other systems like uh, PhoneGap and Xamarin um, compared to, you know, doing native apps? Do you have any, any uh, ideas? I like the idea. And I know that with Xamarin, you can get a basic, uh, like a, a, a setup that'll let you go out and do that. Use the single, write your code in C sharp, and then deploy it across the different platforms. I think if you're going to do it uh, for a real app, you have to actually get a license for it. Um, PhoneGap is nice because it'll actually compile down to native uh, apps running on the phone. I like that idea. Uh, but I can, with this, you'll see I can go out and I can just create an iOS app or an Android app. It'll give me the source code in Objective-C or in Java uh, to go out and do that. Um, so I created this, this CodeCast mobile service here. You'll see I can create a new PhoneGap app if I want to. Um, I'm going to just create an HTML site. So what I'm going to do is create a new HTML application for um, working with this mobile service. And we'll do it like a to-do list where we can put in things that we want to demo or show you guys tonight. So I'm going to create a to-do item table, which is going to create for me in my SQL database a table that's going to be uh, mapped out to uh, my service. And then I'm going to download the app to actually uh, do something with it. You'll notice it's got a download, so I can just click on open. It opens up a window, a zip file where I can extract the stuff out. And I'll put this into a folder here. And we'll just throw it just in the native place where it wants to do it. And the cool thing about this is if I click on the server, um, you'll see for HTML, if I'm running a Mac, you could run the launch Mac command. Um, if you're running Linux, it'll start a shell that'll start up the appropriate web server. Um, I'm just going to run it on Windows. Go ahead and say open. And then uh, go ahead and run this. It opens up a um, nice little window here saying, do you want to actually run it? Say yes. And then when that gets going, then I can come over to where I've got my mobile site, and I can browse out to it. And here's our mobile service for our little app, right? So create a site where we can do something more. Add that, right? Test security. Add identity or whatever. But the thing is, is that this is actually going out and it's creating items. These items that are showing up here that I can even go in here and edit are actually being stored in a database somewhere. So that somewhere is up here in the mobile service. If I click on the data, you'll see there's a to-do item table that got created, and here's my items added into the table. They've got a text and a complete date, and they got have an ID. Um, so if I wanted to, I could take that code that's right here, these, not that, go up a folder, go to CodeCast, take these files, copy them, and then let's go ahead and create a, uh, a Visual Studio. I'm going to go into Visual Studio. I've got Ultimate running here. And just create a uh, simple website. Do you want to create a uh, web app, like an MVC app? Yeah, let's do MVC. MVC is the fun one. That is. CodeCast. Uh, no, that's demos. Let's go to demos. And throw it in here. 
I'm glad I'm not the only one that does that. Welcome to Emos. So I've got an MVC site that I could be working from. And actually, let's like just create an empty site. Thunderdome. Say that again? It's almost like welcome to the Thunderdome. Welcome to the Thunderdome. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. Adding the code. Now we've got an empty website. The beautiful thing about this is it's a simple empty website. Right click here. Go paste. Watch this. This is... See? No moving the hands. It's all right there. Here's my page JavaScript. Notice this thing here is going to have all the code for going out and working with my to-do item table. So I've got things like uh, list items being adding the item ID. If I want to go ahead and insert one, it's going to go out and insert this. There's my text. There's my complete. You know, I might even have something here saying, you know, here's my source. Watch this. Source. And we'll say it's uh, HTML. I just changed the code. I just changed the client. If I run this and go say run this just from the website, this is still the same page, right? But um, what it's got here, let me go back here, is now it's running my local host. I've got the items here. You know, let's publish to web or to cloud. So we're going to publish to the cloud and make this available to uh, people who are listening. So we'll go ahead and take this site. I'm going to right click, and I'm going to go to publish. This is actually kind of cool. So I'm going to publish, and I'm going to say import, and we'll create a new website. So I'm going to say create a new one. We'll call it codecast.azurewebsite.net. It's been taken. We'll call it codecast1. There, look at that. Okay. So should we do this in Europe? No, let's go to US. Uh, we'll use the same database. No database. Don't need it. Don't need no thinking database. Click on next. And what this is going to do is it's actually provisioning a, web, a website on Azure for me now in the uh, free environment. Click OK. It'll create it. And then I can say go ahead and publish this. Save it. And ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, there it is up and going. So now if I come out here, you're going to see I had this unexpected connection failure. What's that all about? So where does that come from? That comes because I'm doing cross-origin resource sharing or cores, which is, hey, it doesn't know anything about this name up here on that mobile service. I have to configure it to say, yes, allow codecast1.azurewebsites.net in to be able to work with that. So let's copy this, hop over here into our configurizer. We're going to go out and configure this thing to work with it. Pull up configurations and then scroll our way down. And down here at the bottom, you'll see here's my cross origin. We'll paste in that and save the changes. Once we've done this, anyone who's out there that wants to go to codecast1.azurewebsites.net can now go ahead and type in and add items into um, our environment here. So if you add new items, you know, they're going to show up. So feel free to go ahead and type them in. And if you do, if we got questions or whatever, they'll just pop up and show up. Kind of cool. Um, but what's happened is inside so this, of our... So I'm going to stop. This, this, is, this is pretty amazing. I mean, we're, we're, we're doing this live, obviously, and people can go... So they can go to CodeCast1 at Azure... What is that? Mobile? Azure Websites. Web, Azure Websites. Dot, dot net. Yep. Dot net. Yeah, go ahead and refresh, Mike. Say that again? Go ahead and refresh your screen, your browser. Oh, I don't even need to do that. It's just right there. Um, there you, go. you see it? Yep. That's in. So, cool. So you're actually updating and putting stuff in there for me? Exactly. I like it. I like it. So here's what's going on is that if I take a look over here on codecast1.azurewebsites.net, Ooh, look at that. I can circle it and draw. Now you can go ahead and type in things. So create a site where we can actually do something. Been there, done that. Gus was there. Yep. What else are we going to do, Gus? Let's see what happens. So um, so we've got our website out here. It's running inside the, the cloud. If I look at the data, you remember I changed the, uh, the look and feel of it, so it told me there was a source of it coming from HTML. Now look at this. We have all this stuff. Someone's saying it show. Come on. Finish the demo. So we can do all of this good stuff. Um, 
But I can also do this. I can go in the script, and I can say, you know what? Whenever I get new items in here, not only can I take stuff that's showing up on the client, but I can also modify the request here. So I can say item dot uh, my data is equal to new data. Or, uh, Mike was here, right? Or I could say item dot created is equal to new date, right? Created date and put a semicolon because it gives me IntelliSense against this too. If I save this now, now I've changed the script for that mobile item. So anytime someone does an insert now, it's going to add these two columns, my data and the created date as well. Right? And if I go to the update, I could say, okay, if you update it, we're going to say item that updated by is equal to script. Someone changed it. Right? And we can save that. And the cool part about this is that if we go back over to our to-do list and refresh here, you know, see if someone has put something in there. Come on. Yeah. Um, you are Batman. Me too. There's an update. Come back over to our data. Look at the data now. We added all those columns for the source, my data, created date, all of that good stuff going on, right? So you've got the ability to change so that you can script and capture stuff coming from the client, but I can also capture stuff coming from the server, right? And if that's not cool enough, I could also go ahead and I could say, let's do this, but let's, uh, let's add some identity to it. So if you click on identity, all I need is an ID for the Microsoft client ID, client secret. You could do Facebook, Twitter, Google, etc. And at that point, then I could go ahead into the scripts and I could say, okay, well, when someone goes ahead and does an insert on this, um, click on the scripts again, I could come over here to the help button, pull it up and say, whenever I get someone doing authentication, authorize the user, I can go out and say item.owner is going to equal to the user.userID. And it, in order to add that is really fast and easy, but the thing is, is it's consistent across all the different kinds of platforms. So this same app runs right now on the web, but if you look at that start place, if you have a Windows Metro app, you've got the, uh, the phone, you've got iOS, Android, uh, Xamarin apps, PhoneGap apps, um, anything you can deploy this to that can talk across that you can go ahead and create and code up whatever kind of cool custom thing you want. So now this is pretty wow, cool. That's, that that is cool. I mean that 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 alone right there. I mean that that's really really cool. I mean I can see you know a lot of nonprofits getting a lot of use out of this stuff. But continue. So so this is cool, right? Because I went ahead and created that page. Um, let's go back out to our page here where we've got CodeCast. Suppose I have let's add something here. I'm going to add. Oh, what do I want to do? I could do an MVC style thing. Let's add a scaffolding item, like an MVC controller. And let's call this my um, my uh, to-do controller, say, right? So this is going to add all the scaffolding items for MVC to this empty site, but it's going to add all the things it needs to be able to turn this on. Um, and then I can create something that would work more with the responsive look and feel of Bootstrap if I wanted to or something along those lines. Um, so it adds the to-do, here's my action result as an index, there's my bootstrap stuff, um, if I go down here into my layout, here's my layout CSH HTML with all that cool stuff, um, come into my to-do, let's go into my controller, where did I put my controller? The wrong spot, let's put that in the controllers. So if I come into my controller, I take the view, and I say, go to the view, add a view, call it index. Then I could actually go in here and I could have um, some stuff running off of that. Um, so let's see. That's the wrong one. Yeah. If I had everything set up right, it would just be cool. Um, <laughs> I don't have the code, but um, I, I was playing around with creating you know, some MVC, but the idea is that you can really build out some neat things going on with how this thing is actually running. 
and uh, ed make changes to it live and on the fly. So let's see if this thing is actually going to run. So I didn't actually put anything into it. It's just an empty, you know, whatever. But if this doesn't blow up and break, here we are. We're looking at stuff going here. Now I'm going to go back over to the browser, and I've got the website I created, right? So I created cloud. Where is it? My websites. Didn't we create a code ca CodeCast one? Did I get the wrong subscription? Uh, refresh. I could have sworn we did. Yeah, I think I created it in here, and I don't know that it updated the uh, assets of the uh, portal when I did that. So I should see it here. So there's CodeCast, right? So one of the things that's kind of cool about CodeCast, about the Windows Azure uh, websites, this is new, I just found this. If you click on configure, I was looking at this, I was like, okay, well, this is kind of cool. What is it you can do? You can configure the .NET framework. So you have, you know, the different versions, 3.0, 4.0, 4.5, 4.5.1. Um, you've got the PHP if you're running that. You've got your pipeline. Just scroll down here, it says, oh, edit in Visual Studio online. Now, I don't know if you've seen this, but if I click on OK, turn that on, say yes, like that. Yep, this is new. So I'm now turned on to edit this in Visual Studio Online. I go back to the dashboard, and I scroll down here where it says here, edit in Visual Studio Online. So this is now going to go out, log in here. I'm a Benko. And then from here, I'm actually logged in, and I can see here's my index HTML page, right? And I can see the, here's my to-do list code cast. I could come down, and this says Windows Azure. This is called Mike's Demo. Mobile services. Let's change this. And let's click back over here to my to-do list, refresh the page. And look at that. It says Mike's Demo. If I were to go back out and change this to say, wow. Live changes, scary. Refresh the page. It's actually updating the website live with Visual Studio through the cloud. That is really just, cool. Yeah, and just immediately as well. I mean, it's this the the speed of this thing. So mobile services, I've been talking about a lot, and it's really cool. And you know, there's a lot of cool things you can do because it it applies across so many different areas. But when you take mobile applications, you tie it into the cloud, and then you add the ability to make changes. I mean, I remember we talked about rapid application development being where you could actually build something in two weeks. Now we can do the same thing, but you right. work from home. Yeah, and it, and you can do it in a day or two. Oh, it, it's amazing what you can do with this. Um, so now you can actually spend your time focused not so much on on uh, what's what's there, but you can, um, let me come back over here and go back to, where, how do I change it back to me? There we go. So you're spending your time instead of um, trying to figure out how to write code as you're doing stuff, you know, thinking about the application. What does it need to do? How is it supposed to work? How is you it know, getting how, done, right? Yeah. Like efficiency and making sure that you're working bugs out instead of working on so much of the UI uh, element. Mm -hmm. As much as I love handling authentication and authorization headers <laughs> in an HTTP request, right? Okay, so I can focus on having a good idea and turning it into you know something that makes smoke come out of the chimney, right? Well, exactly. That, uh, that and being able to spawn things. So now we're entering the DevOps arena, right? Where we're actually spawning machines, sites, etc. Uh, you know, on demand instead of having to, you know, submit requests and wait weeks or hours and have them set up incorrectly and et cetera. We're mm -hmm. actually out there just doing it as we're developing. Well, and in, in, in some cases that's okay. In some cases that's not okay, right? So uh, yeah. uh, a lot of enterprises probably wouldn't like it if their websites were being edited live. Um, <laughs> no, but their, de their dev sites would be great, right? As long as the dev site's done, right? And then you could you could push to staging, production, integration, whichever stages your company has, um, very easily once you've been able to control the development environment. 
Mm -hmm. Well, one other thing I'll show you here on the um, and, and and the the changes on the websites is you know this is hugely scalable. I mean, I can click on the site or the the parameters for this, and I can scale this up. Um, I happen to be running in standard mode, so if I click on standard mode, then it allows me to go out and say, okay, well, here, run this all the way through here. I can then do some scaling on CPU where I say, you know, scale up if I have too much CPU up to seven instances. I can set my, you know, range so that I always, you know, spin up to make sure I've got enough machines to go ahead and handle this. Um, and this is all just built into the cloud. So it's like, you know, provisioning time, seconds, you know, and, and being able to respond to spikes in demand. Um, other things that are new that are worth uh, looking at is that on this CodeCast site, if I click on the dashboard, come over here, I can say, you know what, I really want to be able to do a staging site. So I can turn on stage publishing. And what this does is it's going to create a, a staging slot for this application, which means that from Visual Studio now, I can, I can publish out to the staging slot, and then, uh, then my DevOps guy can say, okay, well, swap it in, make it real. And they can swap it back and turn it back to something else. Now that's powerful. Definitely. It's very cool stuff. So, so show that's what more. I'm doing for fun. Show us more. Show us more. I need more. <laughs> what do you want to see? What do you want to see? Let's see some more. Let's see some more. What more can we do with these? Uh, what, what more can we do with this CodeCast um, a demo that you got going on here? I mean. Um, can you put some maybe some widgets and some interactive things on here or what? So being pure cloud or doing something with Visual Studio or .NET 4.5, um, have you played around with uh, with the uh, database migrations? No, but I would so like to learn more about it. I've always wanted to do database migrations. I always thought that would be a cool thing to do. I always told my kids, you know, if you're going to do something, go do database migrations. They probably um, tilted their head to the side and looked at you like you were the, they were a dog, right? They said, you should ask your mom. She would <laughs> right. do that, right? So suppose you've got a, it's just a simple class like person, right? So here's okay. my person class. Okay. And my person class is going to have a few properties. I'll have an ID. We'll have an int, and we'll call this my person ID, right? I have another property for their name, say. Name, yeah, there we go. And I have another one, say email, right? And the thing with MVC and working with data is that I can take this class and I can say, if I built it, the project, you have to build it first so that it knows about the class, is I can right-click on the controller and say add, and I can add a new scaffolding item, being like an MVC uh, controller with views using the Entity Framework, which allows me to read, write, and create interesting stuff. Say, so go ahead and add that. We'll call this our people controller. People controller, because it's going to control the people. By remote control, yeah. I Let's like go. the name of that oh. thing, buddy. I like the name of that thing. We are the people controllers. So then I'm going to add a data, a, a, like a data contest, or context. Blah, blah. Say add. Now this is going to take that model and it's going to create something that would actually work with my site if I were to create something that understood how to do this. There's probably going to be a little bit of work um, to make it go. Let's see. So this is going to go out and it's going to create um, a bunch of code for me, right? So I've got my code cast, I've got my data context. If I click on my people controller here, you can see here's where it's got a list of them. It's going to go out and return back a view of those. The view is going to be down here in the people. If I take this site and I just said run it, and it comes up and it shows me here's my to-do list. But if I type in people right here, then it's going to go out and we're going to say, yeah, allow. Uh, no, that's not going to be what I want. People slash index. Hmm. Maybe it'll work. You know what I'm missing is my uh, route stuff that normally gets created in an MVC app. So without that, I could do this, and it's now going to figure out where it is, but I can create new people here. So I create a new person, say Mike. Mike at Benko.com. There's my email. And then we could add Gus. 
Gus at mail.com and JJ, right? That's right. And we'll do it at mail.com. I don't know. But the thing is, is that we have actual real data that I can go out and I can look at this and we can see stuff showing up here. Mm-hmm. Where did that actually get created? Because I didn't say anything about a database, but it seems to know that. Well, the place where it got created is in this app data folder. So if I show all files here, you'll see that there's a code cast context database. They actually created something with tables out here that has my people. And if I look at it, expand it down, you'll see that it's actually got some data. It's got some design to it. So it's going to have a couple columns, a person ID, a name, and an email. Um, but what's cool is that this people controller talking to a database is actually um, out here and very easily I was able to go out and create something that works with this. Now I'm going to do a what's called database migration on this which means that I've got this running right now inside of my local database to this local database file right here mm-hmm. which is my local MDB. I want to run this to the cloud and host it there so to make that work what I'm going to do is I'm going to go under the tools, go down to where we've got this thing called the NuGet Package Manager, and I'm going to go to the console of that. And inside of this CodeCast project, I'm going to install a package here. Make that a little bit bigger so you can read it. Say so install package, or no, enable migrations. Press return. This is now going to go out and it's going to look at the database context and it's going to create for me a bunch of scripts that allow me to actually go out and create a database migration. So if you look here, I have an initial create. This folder on the right, the migration folder, has a bunch of things in it. It's got an initial create, and it's got changes that I make. But it's going out and it's creating a table called people. It's got the different types of columns. There's a migrate up and a migrate down. So if I were to do the downgrade, it would drop the table of people. Um, in the initial create, it also is going to go ahead and it's going to run what's going to be called a, a, a initializing script. So the initial create is going to go out and it's going to create all this stuff. Let's go down here. I'm going to say add migration initial create. And this is now going to actually add the pieces it would need to be able to run this. Now. This is cool because I can say, okay, here's my configuration. It's got some seed data. I could add you know, more information here if I wanted to. Um, but typically what happens is you take this and you say, okay, you, you come down and you run this thing called update database. And that then will go ahead and run my migration out against the database and take anything that's out there and apply it to the, to the database that's running here. Now, if I were to change my class, so say our person has more information, like say we've got a URL. String. Let's do. How about their Twitter handle? And we'll save that. And if I were to go out to my controllers and I go to my index and say I want to say add the view, which would update the view, say yeah, it's going to overwrite it. Um, actually, I didn't want to do that. I want to do this index, add view, and I'm going to do. Uh, this was the details, or no, this was the list, wasn't it? Yep, list. There we go. I didn't want to do empty. And I'm doing this against my person. Say add. So now it's going to replace that with something that's going to show these extra fields, right? So it's got my uh, name, email. I just thought it would pull in the other stuff. I think you have to rebuild it first. Now let's go ahead and build it. You're probably right. So, again... What are we looking at? People controller, index, add view, overwrite, list, with model. And model is going to be person, codecast context, crank. And you could do this for that one, for the index. You could also do the details, where it's going to show the details of that, add the view. And this is now going to update that as well. So this would be like the details. Use the model class for person, add. And if we click on run, now we're going to get this thing coming up. So here's our person details. And let's go back to index.
bad request, bad request. It doesn't know it because guess what? We have to actually update the database. So with this, what we're going to do is we're going to say, go out to our package manager. And from here, we're going to say, add another migration, modify people. And then we're going to update the database. And by doing that, it's now going to actually apply these files in the order that they got created, right? So if you run it again, then you're going to get something that says, go to the people index. And there's our details. If you click on Mike, you know, edit, then you've got the uh, information there. I forgot to update that one. But there's our Twitter Twitter handle showing up, and you've got the other information that would be created. So if I was to go out and create a new one, um, again, yeah, I'd just have to update the view that's got that. But the thing is, is this is running locally here. If I right-click and I say publish, let's do this. I'm actually going to stop this thing, cancel this. Let's go back. I'm going to say publish and debug, and I'm also going to tie into a database. So I'm going to say uh, let's create a new database and execute code first migrations, connect up to a database. Uh, okay, we'll just pick a database and throw it out there. Click on next and publish. Now it's going to go out and it's going to create um, this stuff, but it's also going to publish it into the cloud, into the database that I specified on my SQL Azure instance. So now I can go out and I can create this stuff and actually tie it into real data running in the cloud against a real database server. So it's going to push up all the extra stuff it needs for the MVC, like the antler, the runtime, um, entity framework stuff. That is really cool. All right. That that is hot. That is very slick. I like that a lot. Yeah, totally. It and takes what's everything out uh, away from the developer and just allows us to control everything? You know. Here's something else you can do. Is so if I'm on the people controller and suppose I'm, I'm sitting here and I say mm -hmm. trace dot. Oh, wait, let's do trace control period. We're going to add the system diagnostics right line, and we're going to right line. I guess. And did that publish finish? It's still publishing. It's so here's my web publish activity. Yeah, it's still going. Cranking down, lots of stuff going out. SQL Server, Entity Framework. Plus it's got all the PDBs too. Yep. Yeah. So the first time it sends it, it's going to push everything up there. And then when it gets done with that, then it'll just do a, a Delta publish, publish on it, yep. which will be presumably a lot faster. It has so, been my experience. So what's the questions that we've got? Anything in the queue? Nothing in the queue, but yeah, I do I, have... I, oh, go I, ahead, JJ. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I do over here, um, um, IT Guy 27 is a hot name right there. Uh, it's concerned with, uh, you know, uh, being able to onboard and offboard. You know, basically I think what he's trying to get at is uh, when you're when you have a local network and um, you're trying to figure out a cloud solution to migrate all of your information on over to that uh, that the the Azure service as opposed to everything being in a localized network, um, the security concerns with that as well as you know shutting down a section of uh, you know shutting down a part of the farm if you will, and then you know upgrading you know the servers. And then mm -hmm. shutting those down and upgrading the other ones. What, what do you have to say about the, those kinds of situations? So, is the question have to do with how do you handle the runtime of the cloud in services and uptime? Right. Um, hold on. Why didn't people work? Um. I missed the question. So could you say state the question again? So, 
Uh, JJ, I've got it. Um, I think what they're talking about is the uh, unloading and offloading of new sites. Um, how do you take care of uh, making sure of one, security, and two, the ability to do upgrades without causing major outages? So how do you do upgrades without breaking your real live? Yep, exactly. And I always think on scenario. Um, so, so you can use the staging uh, sites to be able to do a swap. So you know, when I built this, I could have published it into a staging slot and then done all my testing against that. Gotcha. Um, the other is to run multiple instances. So these cloud services and stuff like that are on machines that are expected to break. And when they do break, they move it onto a new server, but it will take you know, a little bit of time for that to happen. So during that interim, uh, the reason why you run more than one instance is so that the other instance is up and handling the traffic while the main instance or the other instance is brought back online. Okay. okay. Yeah, that answers the question. Thank you. Yeah. So if you're gonna, so here's a, a kind of a follow up to that. So if you're going mm -hmm. to say run four instances of a website, right? You're doing an upgrade, yep. um, and you're using the staging server. Is that just a cutover? In other words, you just tell it to go. The app pools unload. They reload uh, from the other instance technically, and then off it goes. Is that how it kind of functions in the background? Kind of like that. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Perfect. So. So here we've got our site, right? And it's up and running, but I'm getting errors when I go out to my people, right? I go to people, and I go to the index, and I keep getting this 500. So what's going on? What's broken, right? So how do you fix this? Well, usually you end up debugging something to see, okay, well, why would this be breaking? How do you debug it, though, right? So here's something that's kind of cool that's new in the, in the cloud, is I can right-click, and in the server explorer for all of the Windows Azure stuff that I've got, I can come down and I can pull up that website, and this is where it'll actually allow me to go out and see uh, information about all the websites I've got in the cloud, because I've logged mm -hmm. into Visual Studio as myself. Mm -hmm. And then the websites, once it loads there, you'll see here's my code cast right there, is I can right click on here and I can go down to the settings, and I can view the settings directly from here, and I can go out and say, you know what, take our, uh, logging and turn that to be verbose, right? Because I added that real nice mm -hmm. trace line. Yep. And then I can say, go ahead and save my changes. Click on that. And it's actually going to apply now all the changes I've made in here. So like if I had connection strings, I could change them. If I had application settings, I could change them. Um, if I come back over to my server explorer and I right click now, I can go and say view the streaming logs in the output window. And so now it's actually going to go out to this and anytime someone goes out and runs the site where I've got something like this running against the people index. I could refresh this. And now you can say, hey, there's that high gust line, right? Yep, Showing up in the streaming log. I can also right click on this and say connect, attach the debugger. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to debug this site in the cloud from Visual Studio at my desktop. Now that's slick right there. So we'll open this up on my index. Where was my... Uh, it was on the uh, controller. Yeah. So we'll let this thing connect up. That's going to go out to the controller. Let's browse out to the controller here. Here's my people controller. We'll put a breakpoint on this trace line. And let's go back over here to this bad boy. And go to this, go slash people, index. And now you'll see that I'm actually in debug. It will have just written out the high gus, and now I've got all the locals. I've got all the watch. I've got all of the find result. I've got autos. Yeah, so then I can go in here and I can say, okay, well, pull this in and start now diving through that. So there's some fairly compelling, interesting things about uh, working with the cloud where you can tie this into your mobile apps and be able to seriously see what's going on, be able to uh, debug it, figure it out, um, upgrade well, it, scale it. Yeah, I was just going to say, I didn't mean to interrupt, but the first thing that popped in my head was uh, user experience, being able to tweak any kind of um, you know, issues that pop up, uh, being able to do quick fixes and quick turnaround times to, to get those issues resolved. Sure. I mean, it's, it, 
it's very cool, you know. And, and and this is you know this is doing the editing from Visual Studio, which is probably where you want to do this because I would tie this into like TFS and mm-hmm. do my deploy. So I check it in TFS after I run my tests to do the deployment as opposed to editing the website live online. Mm-hmm. You just do that because you like living on the edge. Yeah, but you know, in, in in a test scenario, this actually makes a lot of sense because you're actually testing on the server that the app app code is running on to be able to see what's happening there that isn't happening on your local workstation, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what we, uh, you know, eventually want to get to to be able to fix issues. Yep. Well, so this, this is cool. This is- Fantastic and awesome. I, I, I really honestly wish we had more time, but I'm going to have to call it. Um, yep. uh, that does end the uh, CodeCast section, uh, as ominous as that sounds. Let's move on to what our guest thinks about the future. Um, so uh, you've had maybe a little bit of time or no time at all. Either way, I'm going to ask you the question. What do you see, uh, what do you see being the next uh, new big technology thing within uh, you know, uh, the next niche technology? There's this really cool technology for communication called CB radio. Um, <laughs> I, it was. <laughs> oh wait, has that been done? Right. Okay, that's been done. <laughs> no, I, no mean, I, think, I, I mean, you look at the stuff that we're doing with the mobile and the cloud and yeah. tying things together. I think we're going to see a unification of the mobile technologies, but okay. that's going to take five years. It's you not going to be. I, I we have Android, iOS, Windows, HTML. You have so many choices, and getting parity and trying to see who's going to be the winner. You know, at, at the end, the end being you know someone dominating the market share. No one saw Android coming. No one saw iOS coming. It's like you right. know, six years ago, it was you know Windows Phone was probably you know and BlackBerry were the two players. And then, boom, they're both dead almost and, you know, struggling to come back and getting back in the game. Sure. So mm-hmm. uh, I, think, I think it's a very fluid thing right now. It's not going to solve itself in the next whatever. But as people upgrade and look at what they want to do, they're going to try to find devices that work for them. Right. And, yeah. So I, You know, uh, in regards to that, you know, a lot of people have made the case for the the web app being, you know, the default go-to type of scenario just because even though it doesn't directly t- tie into the, you know, the uh, uh, APIs of the phone or device or whatever, um, I get that. You know, I, I kind of, I get why people say that, right? Because mm-hmm. the, you're kind of, you're, you're just, you know, I mean, anybody could access it from kind of any type of device depending on the scenario, but that doesn't work for all scenarios. So you got to think about, you know, what's the hardware situation going to look like. And I, you know, we, we see these kinds of evolutions with the, the devices and the technology and stuff. Um, you know, do you, do you seeing it be kind of a, an Internet of Things, if you will? I mean, I know that term's been thrown, thrown around quite a bit, but, I mean, mm-hmm. Azure seems to be able to handle this kind of stuff and, and, and going to be handling it uh, going forward. So these wearables and these different things that we can communicate to make our lives easier and more efficient. Um, yeah, I, I, I see, uh, you know, just what you've shown here and uh, different, you know, other things that we've seen and going mm-hmm. into the future, you know, this connectability being, you know, pretty pretty significant. Pretty huge. When you look at, you know, connecting things and people and stuff together, you know, the CB radio was cool because you could talk to people, and you know, on the highway. You know, yeah, rubber duck. We're just uh, we'll be catching up with uh, with Grandma here. <laughs> All right. You know, <laughs> but but now you can do it on Twitter, and you could do it with Skype, and you've got the Snapchat. You've got all these different things. So, taking the tools and the data and the pieces and tying them together in new ways. I mean, that's that's where the that's where the the money's at. That's where mm-hmm. you know people are looking at it and saying, how do we drive this? Right. Well, that's a, that's a good point, you know. And JJ, you you bring up a good point because a lot of companies are doing the whole bring your own device initiative, right? right? Mm-hmm. And and the only way that they can feasibly do that is either one, hire a huge staff to go out and write, you know, um, uh, you know, specific apps for Three the different devices. Different yep. Mm-hmm. Or they go, you know, HTML5 and JavaScript, and hope that all the devices support it. Right. Well, you, you look at what they're doing with Windows 8 mm-hmm. and 8.1, where a native language is HTML and yep, JavaScript. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's what we're seeing. Do yep. you think there's anything that's going to happen that way? 
<laughs> uh, there's there's definitely a possibility, I would Think. say. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so what's going Sorry. on next week? Yeah. Scratch your ticket. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, Gus, why don't you go ahead and uh, throw up some final questions for uh, for our guest, Mike? Sure. I guess the the main one that I have for you is, you know, um, a lot of developers have their their uh, you know niches that they they like to do. But what do you like to do when you're away from the keyboard? So like when I'm away from the keyboard and um, Have, having fun, having certainly fun. working. You know, yeah, so, don't work. So when I'm not working. Uh, I do like to, uh, you know, kind of putter around the house. I've, I, I've got some woodworking projects and stuff like that. Um, I like music. I like, uh, you know, banging on the keyboards that are not attached to a, a processor. Um, <laughs> right. Cool. You know, that's kind of fun. And uh, just, uh, I like getting out and talking to people and, and sharing. You know, this, the, when you go through this technology, you know. There's a lot of cool stuff about it, but I like to uh, get out to conferences and and just share what I've what I've been seeing, what what's been going on. Um, well, I'll tell you one thing: uh, the the uh, Matrix can't come fast enough because what you just did and your general knowledge, you and Gus and everybody that I've talked to, I just want to like link in, you know, USB 125.0, and uh, just you know, upload done. I know how to do it. Um, You've heard of USB 4, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of lightning and a uh, thunderbolt or whatever, you know, BS. But um, no. So yeah, I mean that is cool, and and you make a good point. You know, uh, actually, Gus is going to be a KCDC, and so is our uh, our other uh, founder of STL Tech Talk is going to be a KCDC. Uh, uh, Kevin's so going to be there as well. So um, so but, yeah, I mean talking to people. Uh, that's interesting because, you know, I, honestly, uh, when you have somebody who knows so much about uh, what you know about, uh, the personalities sometimes conflict, right? Uh, right? They're not exactly people, persons, I guess you could say. Yeah. So that, that, that's cool that you actually do enjoy that and the woodworking stuff. That's pretty hot, yeah. man. I like that. Well, I'm going to be doing this talk on the mobile services at KCDC. So Good. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah so Good. I'm on down. Yeah, for sure. So, so our, Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, JJ. So, where can uh, our audience find out more about you and follow you and so on and so forth? So, I've been running a developer resource site for a long time called BankoTips.com. So, I think it's even on my my tagline there. But mm -hmm. if you go to BankoTips.com, I've got about 150 hours of webcasts that I recorded for Microsoft. They're available. Um, you can also go to Learn Now Online and download courses that I've been recording since I left Microsoft. Um, awesome. You can follow the blog. I haven't been blogging as much as I used to. Um, I'm on Twitter as at mbenko, and uh, you can always reach me, Mike at benko.com. Um, if you have questions or you want to see something, hey, let's pull up and just do a quick chat. I'd be glad to help help people figure out how to do stuff. So um, I'm a resource that's available and you know, you know, subject to scheduling and availability. I'd be glad to answer questions anyone's got. So adopt me. Perfect. Right. Adopt me. No, I mean. <laughs> no. So, uh, Gus, why don't uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, take us into our uh, applications and packages of the week? Sure. Uh, every week we try to pick a cool package, uh, either NuGet or application based. Um, this week mine is Auto Mapper. It's one of the tools that I use in a lot of my MVC um, solutions. It helps me to take Entity Framework classes and ship them to POCO classes and back very quickly and easily. Uh, it's very fast. Um, I've actually seen it speed up a lot of code, and it keeps us from writing the boring, tedious, you know, convert to POCO, convert to view model, convert to, you know, entity framework model code. Um, I hate doing that, and I would much rather write two lines of code and have it done for me. Um, not to mention the fact that it uses uh, reflection to go through and, and deal with parameters. So if you had a, a person class like we just did, and the person has an... Uh, a secondary table that's linked to it, you can actually use that table name plus the property name and it will automatically bring it in and put it back out. Um, very nice um, for me to utilize to do view models for all of my applications. So that that can be found at uh, http uh, automapper.org. Great tool uh, and it's in uh, NuGet as uh, install package automapper. Works with all the cool. different versions. 
Awesome. And Very I'm going to make mine kind of short. Uh, the Web Essentials 2013 is out uh, for Visual Studios. You can uh, go to Visual Studios as an add-in for MSDN. I thought that was pretty cool, but, you know, watching some of this Azure stuff, it's like, whoa, holy cow. Uh, but e either way, I mean, I think it's a good resource for your Java and, and trying to, um, uh, you know, get exceptions and, you know, get rid of some of those uh, encountered errors and, you know, it, it, it's, it's pretty useful for the web developers, so I, I suggest everybody check that out. That'll be in our uh, show notes. Mm -hmm. um, also, just wanted to let everyone know that Gus is going to be doing the Code Camp in Lincoln, Nebraska from uh, March the 28th through the 29th, four-hour workshop, MVC. Speaking of MVC, MVC, you know, we probably said MVC enough on this podcast. I might say it one more time, MVC. Applications are a breeze with breeze.js. Um, he's also going to be at Build, which, by the way, everyone, if uh, for your uh, visual uh, pleasure, here's our new shirts. A little higher, JJ. Oh. Boom. Look at that. I want one. Our new shirts with uh, CodeCast, hashtag CodeCast. That's us, nope. right? Nope, that I'm also wearing one, JJ. Nice. So, nice. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. for sure, so, uh, for sure. I will have those with me at build. So if anybody that's watching this wants one, uh, we've got XL and double XLs. I will have them with me at build. Come up and find me. I'll be wearing one as well. Yep. And uh, that's going to be going from April the 2nd to the 4th. So keep your eyes on stltechtalk.com under our events coverage page. We're going to have a whole page dedicated to this. Um, also, KCDC, both of uh, both uh, Mike and Gus is going to be there. Uh, that's going to be May the 15th through the 17th. I'll be graduating then. Applications uh, are Breeze with Breeze.js. Uh, remote validations with uh, Fluent Validations and Web API. Um, some upcoming shows, obviously, Build. Uh, Brian Randall is going to be on. Uh, Don Felker is going to be on as well. Also, JJ is going to be in St. Louis at the Microsoft offices for a web, oh, excuse me, a Windows app creation day where we're going to be uh, making some Windows Phone and Windows 8 apps with our local uh, WP St. Louis meetup group. That's going to uh, be awesome. Yeah, it's, it's going to be so much fun. It's going to be really cool, man. I wish both of you could be there to show me how much I don't know. Um, <laughs> Thursday night, we're actually going to have uh, Ver Vernon Smith from Glance and Go Radio, a guy who likes talking about Windows and all that above. Uh, so he's going to be, I guess, on Thursday night. Also, I'm going to be uh, not on the panel but covering the St. Louis Tech Panel, focused on the future of St. Louis's tech scene. Uh, a lot of big players are going to be there. I'm going to be there as well, uh, talking to them about uh, what we could do to continue to help the St. Louis uh, scene grow. Uh, we are growing. Uh, one of the biggest uh, local uh, tech, com you know, uh, booming tech town, I'll just say that. So cool. it's really nice for tech startups, and, and we do arch grants and things like that. And hopefully uh, we'll be able to start one of those ourselves and start our own conference. But uh, having said that, guys, man, I, I can't thank you uh, both. And, Mike, we can't thank you enough for coming on the show. We, you got to come back and tell us, you know, s some more uh, information. It's just, it, you know, uh, I'm, you're, it's, it's like the tip of the iceberg with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, so if you like hearing yourself talk or like us not talking and you just talking, uh, we'd love to have <laughs> you back on. So, uh, But thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts. We do. We really appreciate it. Cool. Yeah. Gus, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I was just going to thank Mike, myself. Uh, it's always fun to s sit down and talk to you or listen to you talk. Uh, you always have a wealth of knowledge, and I can't wait to have you back on the show again. I look forward to it. Definitely. Cool. Definitely. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Well, um, again, Mike, thank you for being on the show. Thank you to all of our fans. We love you, and thank you for your support. And from the entire STL Tech Talk crew, good coding. We're out. <laughs>